What's going on everybody? It is fishing time and we are out here at Surfside Jetty Park. I'm out of it man. It is super early. I got like three hours of sleep and uh, yeah, we're out here super duper early uh, for one reason. Actually, it's kind of like two reasons. It's the weekend. We're out here fishing with my grandpa and my cousin today. So we've got some special guests and it should be a, a really great day for us. There have been a ton of speckled trout being caught. It's getting around that time of year where the speckled trout will start to spawn. And you can catch some really nice big ones here at the jetty uh, using the same similar tactics to what we've been doing for sheep's head. So uh, if you guys remember last year when I caught my 31 inch trout, it was around this time of year. Um, so we're out here bright and early trying to fight over one of the spots that has uh, always been just better than some of the other ones. Also, uh, we wanted to get out here early. We bought our shrimp last, or yeah, we bought our shrimp yesterday so we didn't have to wait for the bait shops to open. And uh, we got everything loaded up, fixing to head out to the spot. And we're gonna have to actually wait till sun up to start fishing, but anything to get on these big trout. So y'all stay tuned. All right, y'all, we have made it out to the spot. We got our stuff here set up. All the guys are out. And really quickly before we get started, uh, still kind of waiting for that sun to come over the horizon. Just wanted to go over the rig and how we have it set up so over here we've got ourselves an outcast weighted cork and that is going to go up to a three-way swivel there uh, don't mind mine i have kind of a ghetto setup it's a split ring with three double barrel swivels uh, i don't have a three-way so i just kind of made my own and uh, that is tied directly to our main line there that is some braid and then this is going to come down so this portion of line leading to our swivel is going to be about a foot to a foot and a half and then this portion coming down to our hook here we've got a split shot weight about a foot away from our little hook we're using size four hooks um octopus hooks i i believe i'll show you all the package later when we get a little better lighting but yeah, those tiny hooks are uh, really good. I kind of keep them, uh, I'm using the literal exact same rig if you guys watch the sheep's head fishing video. And uh, you could use different hooks. Trebles work well if you're trying to catch your limit, which limits have changed. Uh, we should talk about that really quick. Here in Texas, we have a new limit for trout. It's going to be three. Uh, the slot is 15 inches to 20 inches, and you can keep one trout over 30. Good luck catching a, a trout over 30 inches. That's a really tough, a tough catch to make um and if you do catch that and you're not putting it back i don't know i'm i'm definitely judging you that's that's a fish of a lifetime you always want to put those back so they can go out and continue breeding especially during the spawn but whatever i don't want to uh, be up on a soapbox for you guys either way we're going to be putting that to a tiny little hook as far as bait selection goes we're going to want to use tiny little shrimp if you're fishing in my area specifically the surfside jetty bridge bait has some really small shrimp if you're coming out for the morning bite bridge bait does only open at six o'clock so that's pretty pretty dang late to be opening for the morning bite uh, especially if you're coming out on the weekends you want to get out here and get your spot reserved so um, maybe buy your bait uh, the night before if you have that available like as an option for you but yeah that pretty much covers everything small hook small bait same setup and we're going to be casting as far as we can pretty windy day so it might be a little hard to cast hopefully it's not going to interfere with our ability to fish but it should be a good day and any minute here we're going to be able to start making some casts there we go got ourselves a nice small shrimp we got some big ones mixed in there we went to another bait shop this morning just to have extra spare shrimp these are the ones we're looking for though nice small guy I think I forgot to mention how long our main line is. Um, that's usually about six to six and a half feet. Total depth you wanna be fishing is uh, anywhere from nine to like eight foot deep. And you can kinda of change it up, mix it up as you fish. If you see somebody catching and you're kind of lacking, you can ask them how deep they're fishing. Kind of adjust your setup like that. It's pretty annoying with this cause you have to retie, but it is what it is you got to do what you got to do to get on the fish we're going to cast it as far as we possibly can 
Uh, I found that trout kind of stay further out than a sheep's head would. Whereas sheep's head, you'll be fishing real close to these rocks, kind of suspending that bait over the cracks. With a trout, they're gonna be further out. That's kind of poetic. Another thing, pro tip, keep tension on your line. It's gonna kind of slowly bring your cork in and uh, it'll allow you just to keep making casts so you don't get super bored. But keep in tension on that line, you're gonna be able to feel everything that's going on with your rig. Um, and if you got some of those little bait thieves coming along, love tapping your shrimp, you'll be able to feel it and uh, just get a new shrimp on there as soon as you get robbed. Oh, Grandpa just had a nice one. He had one. Oh, he's got him. Here, let's tighten up that drag a little bit. Okay. There you go. Get the net. He got off. Got off. Damn, man. Okay, That's cool. all right. We're starting to bite. That's good. Whoa. Oh, I thought you lost it. I thought he lost his hook. All right, y'all. Right with the sun. Sun coming up. Looks like the bite's about to start. Yeah. Uh, my grandpa. Actually, we got it on camera. He just got hit and his drag was getting take, taken pretty crazy. So, yeah. He bent out his hook? Yeah. Wow, yeah, that must have been a nice trout. Nah, it was loose and I tightened it. I tightened it because it was loose, but. Tight or loose? It's too loose. That's what I was saying. All right, y'all, well, that is my time, my sign to start casting. Spec? Sand trout. Dang, that's a big ass. <laughs> He's a fat. <laughs> a freaking fatty of a sand trout. That one might be worth eating. Um, I don't know. Their meat is just really grainy. That's my gripe with them. Oh yeah, that's a big fish. Uh, maybe not. Really not too sure. So that is a big sand trout. But still no specs. I'll take it though. We've been getting robbed, so this is better than that. I mean, that is about 14, maybe 13 inches on a Sandy. That's pretty dang big. Little idiot. Those rocks don't feel good, bud. All right, unless we catch like some sort of mutant gargantuan sand trout that's the last one you guys are gonna see in the video oh looks like we got a little bit of cloud cover coming in call me crazy but i have my own theory when it comes to speckled trout um they're usually under their prey right so they're below looking up at shrimp and i kind of like to think of it if you've ever played baseball and you're in the outfield trying to catch like a pop fly and you're staring up at the sun it could be really really tough to aim it could be so tough that you just don't want to even look. So uh, if it's super sunny out, sometimes I think maybe the trout are having a hard time looking up and trying to find their bait. Uh, it hurts their eyes. <laughs> I know it sounds like insane, but it, if you really get past that, it kind of makes sense. So maybe with this cloud cover, we can have a little bit more luck with the specs. Pulling out all the stops here, y'all. Decided to switch it up we're gonna make our leader a little bit longer and i'm even going with the loop knot since it is particularly slow day i uh, decided to go with the loop knot and that's gonna kind of give our shrimp an ability to wiggle around and we've also increased our depth to about i want to say eight or nine feet so we're gonna reattach this to our rig over here and i'm gonna have to get some split shots to get it weighted down but uh, hopefully this is gonna help us get something going here man it's been mighty slow for me uh, got a couple sand trout that's about it I just really at this rate I just want one keeper 
so we can do a catch and cook and make make something out of this day get a nice little video and uh you know have a good time that's what it's all about That's just my literal shrimp. He's just kicking. Yeah, so guys, we are completely out of the small shrimp and we've got these giant ones on there. This guy was just kicking around and it literally felt like I was getting hit. And then I pulled him in and I was like, oh, we didn't get hit. And I felt that exact same feeling and watched him just kicking. It's honestly insane. I'm just trying to get a nice lob. I can literally feel him kicking around down there. It's strong freaking shrimp. It's one of those shrimp that your weights can't even pull down. He's so strong, he'll just swim back up. I'm literally a weightlifter. There we go. This one feels a little bit healthier. You're, oh man, you're gonna cross me. Can you get the net? <laughs> all right, guys. I got a little dicey there. We're fishing all so close quarters. It is the weekend and uh, there's a lot of folks out here, so we have to fish real close to each other. But boys, we have done it. That is a beautiful keeper spec. Do you think he's over 20? No. Thank he's, goodness. Uh, 17, 18. Whew. Gosh, that was so sketchy. Oh man, I don't even know what to say. Let's go ahead and get the measure board and uh, just double check. We do have to make sure he is under 20 inches, but above 15. It's definitely going to be above 15. 17 and a half right there, y'all. So, really quick. We're gonna take care of this guy. Actually, let me put the hat back on and I'll show y'all like the full process of uh, doing Ikejime properly. Cause it's a little bit different than what I usually do. And since it's been so long since we've done a catch and cook, uh, we're gonna do this one extra special, extra nice. All right, y'all, so first step is to get a bucket. We wanna have some water to bleed this guy in. Properly Ikejime a fish. You do need to slit their throat while they're still alive. Um, you want their heart to be beating so they can pump out plenty of blood. Come on, man. Give me that lip. Uh, first, we're going to say thanks to this guy. You made my video, and you're going to make for a really good meal. So you want to get right here. Just kind of slit right there where their throat's at. I'm sorry, buddy. We're going to end it all soon. So we're gonna get this guy in the water like so. I'm just gonna let him kind of bleed out from the throat. And then the next step is gonna be to cut the tail. So we just wanna make an incision right there. And there is a, a blood vessel right in their spine. Just kinda wanna tap into it. You don't wanna cut through his whole tail we do want to cut that that little vein we should start seeing him bleed out of his tail now as well all right y'all so we've been letting this big mama bleed out for a minute and you can see that bucket is full of blood and i'm gonna go ahead and try and give her a couple of dang uh little shakes like that just to help it um if you're on like a proper japanese fishing vessel they'll have a water hose that they stick in their throat and they kind of shoot water through it you'll see blood and water squirting out through the tail through their uh, veins but enough with that you don't want to let these fish suffer too long and spread that cortisol through their system so we're going to quickly go ahead and hit her in the brain you want to trout are a pretty easy one to get just kind of right there in the middle of the head and we're going to send that spike and there we go she is done for you can send it a little further down and uh, try and get that neural canal that runs all the way along their lateral line. 
Uh, if we had our Shikijime wire, that is even better than Ikijime. There's a lot that goes into it. You could write a book. I'm sure someone has about the proper technique. Um, but Ikijime is going to be good enough. We did it the proper way this time where you bleed them before you actually spike them in the brain. And I'm going to go ahead and just insta-clean this thing. Uh, the bite is not too hot. We are nearly out of shrimp. So I'm going to do my best to take extra care of this trout's meat and try and get a solid dish. All right, guys, we have made it back to the house. I'm not too sure what the last thing I recorded out there on the water was. I think we were just uh, taking care of our fish. So we have made it back to the house. I got the whole spread here and uh, we're about to fillet our fish to get into this cook, but it is always best practice to work with a sharp knife. So we're gonna sharpen our knife first. Now, the way I fillet my fish, I'm always getting comments talking about, uh, you should use a fillet knife. Why don't you use a fillet knife? Look, I don't know. I just learned how to fillet fish with a regular chef's knife. That's the way I do it. So mind your business. Actually, you know what? Don't mind your business. Comment down below. It helps, helps with my engagements. So I'd be lying if I said I was the best at filleting fish. Uh, because I'm not the best. I'm not even really that good at filleting fish. But you know, I can get the job done. So we want to make sure we're down there at the guy's backbone. Nice. And then I'd like to turn it this way and I just go kind of along that backbone. So find it, follow it. And it always helps me to make like a slight incision that I can follow. Oh man, see, I'm already messing up. Good Lord. Another thing that I do a lot when I'm filleting trout is like, I'll literally cut right through the backbone. It's a little bit easier on redfish because they're just, their bones are so thick that, you know, you have a hard time cutting through it. You can really just follow their uh, spine. With trout, they're pretty dainty. So it can be easy just to cut right through it at least for me. Oh, cool. Another pro tip I like to do is just keep a napkin on me and wipe off the scales. I never really scale my fish, so there's always scales getting in the way of the knife, but now that we've made that initial incision, I can kind of just follow that and ride his backbone as best we can. And yeah, that's pretty much all there is to filleting fish, so I'm gonna just be quiet and we can ASMR the rest of this. Oh, damn it. I think I already cut through his pack bone. Decent enough. I think I missed a little bit of the meat on the bottom side of the filet. But I mean, hey, look at that. This is where we missed some meat. It's because you got to get in there and then get like that. See, did I hit the backbone at all? Am I gonna have bones in my fillet? Yeah, so like right here, you can see, kind of hit his bones a little bit. Oh well, take some practice. Let's do this other side. So that is both sides done. If we do the hold up test, uh, you can see that there's definitely some meat left on there, but that is okay because right here, Staring me down as I fillet those fish is the world's hungriest cat. So I can go ahead and skim some of this meat off for him. And we don't even have to cook it because Percy loves food so much that he will eat the fish raw. But stuff like that, you know, just so we're not wasteful, that can go to him. Let's go. Let's watch him devour that. Acting camera shy, buddy. So he eats it in a weird, in a weird way. He likes to pull pieces out and then viciously shred it up in his mouth. He'll like grab the whole chunk. <laughs> Look at him, yeah, he just gnaws on it. <laughs> All right, I'll leave him to it and we'll get back to our fish. So the next thing we need to do guys is clean up these fillets. Uh, basically, we're just gonna take the skin off. I like to remove this belly fat area. We can give that all to Percy 
And then I think there's a couple bones in here that I need to take care of. Yeah, several. So meta for removing the skin. I just lay my knife or lay my fillet flat and I kind of like to get it to the edge of the cutting board there. Let's clean this off. Just make sure it stays nice and slick. And then I'll take the fillet. I get myself a portion that I can kind of get into. Then I lay it flat and uh, with a little bit of pressure, if you do too much, then you start collecting the skin on your fillet and that's no good. Like a little bit of pressure here and we just long strokes with the knife. There we go. I'm leaving a little bit of meat behind, but it's not the end of the world. Percy, get down, dude. See, that's the problem with this cat. He gets a taste of the meat and then he starts jumping up on the counter. I actually left a ton of meat behind, geez. Cat's gonna be eating greedy today. So look at that, that is a thick piece. Oh well, I'm the only one eating this fish, so no one's really gonna miss it. Try and do that a little bit better with this filet. It is a bit of a balancing act, like enough pressure to make sure you're not keeping skin on the filet, but not enough to leave meat behind. I'm gonna go maximum pressure here and already, already, look at this chat. We've already jacked it up. <sighs> That's gonna be good. That's gonna be a good one. I can sense it. Oh yeah, guys. Now that, that looks like I'm a Japanese sushi, sushi, sh it's a tongue twister. Sushi chef. That was tough to say for no reason. Oh, damn. You know, we were doing good right there till the very end. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and finish cleaning up these fillets off camera, and uh, we'll get back to you when I am done. All right, guys, so like I said in the last segment, uh, we do have a full house right now, and during the recording of this cook portion for the video, things got really hectic. There was a ton of background noise, so I decided let's just go ahead and do a voiceover. Basically, I'll just uh, talk about what we made and then I'll throw up video on the screen of kind of like what we were making at that time. Um, and if you want exact like measurements for the recipe in, uh, in the video, you can go ahead and go down in the description. I'll put everything there. If we went over every little thing, it would be like a super long video and nobody wants to, nobody wants to sit here and listen to all of that. So uh, basically, the theme for our dish was kind of like an island-ish, islandy sort of vibe. Think Hawaii, Polynesian. Uh, I would imagine they would serve something like this at like a Hawaiian tourist trap restaurant. So that's what we were going for. Uh, I always get caught up making the exact same stuff when it comes to like fishing, catch and cooks. I'll either make, you know, trout tacos, uh, some sort of pasta dish or like seared, pan seared filet over uh, with hollandaise sauce and potatoes. So uh, I wanted to branch out and try something new, try something different, and that's definitely what we did in today's video. Um, now, with every cook, especially when you got a lot of stuff going on in the house, you want to get it started off with some drinks. So we made a classical Mai Tai cocktail. I had actually never had these before uh, recording this video, and I was I was a fan. I won't say I was like my favorite drink ever, but it was pretty good. Um, basically, it's just a rum a rum based cocktail. So you use some gold rum, some white rum, and you mix that with a little bit of an orange liqueur. I was using dry carousel, but you could use, um, you know, triple sec or maybe some Cointreau. Uh, I just prefer the dry carousel flavor over those two mixers. Um, but you mix all three of those liqueurs together, and then you want to add in a little bit of lime juice, a little bit of Argo or Go or uh, almond syrup, simple syrup. And I believe that's it. Yeah, so you shake that all up in a shaker. You're going to pour it over crushed ice is like the traditional way to serve this. I tried the first one with crushed ice. I wasn't a big fan. Um, it kind of just made it hard to drink. So 
we uh, we switched over to normal ice, and I like that a whole lot better. I will say um, the original recipe was very sweet, so I tampered with it a little bit, used a little less um, simple syrup, and um, just mainly because the Argo, the almond syrup, it was already very sweet on its own. I don't think we needed any of that extra sweetness from the simple syrup, so we kind of mixed it and made it our own. And yeah, it was pretty good. It definitely helped to get the vibes going to um, take on these next couple steps because it was a, a serious cook. So uh, the first thing I did was, after making our drinks, of course, uh, set up a marinade for our fish. I also did chicken, so we got chicken thighs and fish. And I cut the fillets into little bite-sized chunks, kind of like think of a nugget. And I did the same thing with some chicken thighs. We made a soy slash coconut based uh, marinade that turned out pretty good. Uh, we did this way ahead of time. I started cooking at like 12. We didn't finish until like 7 or 8, I think. Um, so we had plenty of time to let that fish and chicken soak in the marinade. I would say, you know, one hour is acceptable, but if you can get up to like four hours or even overnight, if you've got a lot of time to plan ahead, that would be uh, definitely your best results with the marinade. So after we got the marinade put away in the fridge and let it sit, I started working on taro rolls. So think of a dinner roll, but we implemented a little bit of taro root. So if you don't know what taro is, it's basically a um, like a, a Pacific Island tuber. Uh, think like a sweet potato. It's kind of a poor comparison. They're not really super similar, but it's like a island sweet potato. So it adds a little bit of a, a different flavor. I will say if you want to try and recreate this, I'll put in optional use taro flour. It would be a lot simpler to just do that instead of go through all the processes we had to do. But I couldn't find any taro flour at any of the stores I went to, so I just took a taro root. Um, I actually took two. We peeled them, cut them into little cubes, kind of like you would do a potato, and then I steamed them for about 15 to 20 minutes put it in a food processor or a blender and you want to just get it down um, processed up into like a nice gummy texture it'll it'll turn into like this gummy uh, mass of taro and uh, basically I just added that to our batter for the bread which is your you know normal flour sugar uh, yeast butter and uh, kind of just threw that in there with all that that stuff. <laughs> And uh, yeah, the reason we started that right after doing the marinade is basically because um, it's homemade rolls. You got to let that yeast rise. So you get your dough formed, put it in a bowl, let it rise for an hour. And then uh, after that, you actually have to punch it down, shape it into little, uh, you know, roll sized balls. And then you let that rise again for another additional hour. So it's pretty time consuming doing this. But I will say the rolls were my favorite part of the entire dish. They came out really good right when they came out of the oven, you know, let them cool for about 10 minutes. And I swear when they were freshly baked, they tasted just like sweet Hawaiian rolls, which is one of my favorites. And it was just a cool way to try that new taro flavor. I'd never had this stuff before. So I was like, yeah, this could be interesting. After we got the rolls going, I wanted to do um, a fried rice. Now, I will say this was definitely the worst part of the dish. Uh, the thing about fried rice is you have to cook your rice that you plan on frying the day before. I didn't do that. I cooked it in the morning and I stuck it in the fridge to get as like dried out as it possibly could. Unfortunately, we just didn't achieve that perfect um, dryness, I guess, moisture level for the rice. So when I got to frying it, it kind of all gooped up on me and got really gummy. I would say it's more like a fried rice pudding than anything. It was a uh, it wasn't great. The flavor was nice. And when we get to the part where we're tasting everything, uh, everyone said, you know, it has good flavor, but I was not happy with the texture. I definitely, if it wasn't just my family, I would not serve that to like dinner party guests or anything because it's just, it wasn't good. It, it was embarrassing really. And finally, after we made our fried rice, I got back into the chicken and fish. So uh, basically what we did was make like coconut fish slash chicken. So think coconut shrimp, how you would bread it with like, uh, you know, panko breadcrumbs and some shredded coconut and uh, you fry it. It's really hard to go wrong with that. I will say one thing, when you're at the store and you're trying to get the shredded coconut, make sure you go for the unsweetened stuff. I have made coconut shrimp before and we used sweetened coconut, like sweetened shredded coconut for baking. And it really makes the whole thing just way too sweet. Like 
I, I don't like having that super sweet flavor. The coconut is already sweet enough and it has that natural coconut flavor. Um, so you don't need the added sugars. It can be hard to find. I had to look around at my HEB. They had like an organic unsweetened version hidden away on the bottom shelf. Uh, but we did get that. And if you can, like I said, just get the unsweetened version. It's going to be a whole lot better, especially when we get to this last portion where we made our sauce. So for the sauce, uh, I feel like coconut shrimp and coconut-esque things like this uh, do pair best with a very sweet sauce, like a marmalade of some sort. Normally, I think people will make like an orange marmalade if you go to a restaurant or something. I wanted to do it a little bit different, so we went with a pineapple marmalade. Um, it's basically just rice vinegar, pineapple, pineapple juice, some brown sugar, um, and a couple different ingredients. I'll, like I said, I'll put everything down in the description. We don't need to draw this out too long. But yeah, the sauce was actually really good. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. I think it went really well with our coconut fish slash chicken. And that is basically the dish. We plated it up. We had our fish chicken bites, uh, a side of fried rice, taro roll, and then a little cup of sauce. And yeah, it was um it was pretty good. But I'll go ahead and play the uh, final taste test here at the end. I hope you guys did. Well, I'm about to say that. So yeah, enjoyed the food. <sighs> All right, everyone. Good. You like the rice? The texture's off. Okay. Like I said, guys, the rice. <laughs> The rice had a good flavor, it just, I mean, just look at it. That's not really what you look at. That looks more like a plate of stuffing, like that looks like someone's Thanksgiving stuffing than fried rice. But it does taste good. Um, admittedly, I've already started eating this plate. I'm wore out, bro. We've been cooking since about noon. It is 7 o'clock right now. No, it's not on, Captain. It's, it's 8 o'clock. <laughs> Um, but it actually really does taste good. The coconut chicken slash fish. It's hard to tell which one is which. You can't really tell. But uh, I've had a taste of both of them. Really good. The coconut is just, you've had coconut shrimp. It's really good. And we made fish and chicken, like coconut shrimp. And these taro rolls, honestly, you got to try these. They taste like King Hawaiian rolls. They're really good. But I'm over it. I'm over recording. I'm over cooking. I just want to sit here and eat. So let's hurry up and do this outro. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hope you guys have a great sales day. Peace.